We are here with Brian Grissy, who is the Educational Director at the Civil War Museum. How would you describe Antietam as a turning point in history? Well, Antietam uh, is definitely a turning point in history, um, especially in the Civil War and in American history. Um, Antietam was Lee's first invasion of the North. It was something that he felt he needed to do. One of the things that Lee faced was that uh, a lack of manpower. Um, the North, you know, continually was able to get manpower, especially from Europe, with immigration coming in. Uh, the South just didn't have that, so Lee felt that if he could invade the North, that Europe would step in on behalf of the South. So with that, um, that's one of the main reasons why Lee went to Antietam. Who were the important officers that contributed to the battle? Well, for the North, you had uh, George B. McClellan. Um, he was the commander of the Army of the Potomac, and for the South, he had Rob Ray Lee, commanded the Army of Northern Virginia. He wasn't a very popular general to begin with. He was seen as old. He was known as uh, the King of Spades because he had an engineering background, so he always made his men dig trenches, and they didn't really like that. But Antietam kind of solidified him as you know the beloved general that we know today of Robert E. Lee. On the other side, McClellan, he was a very good organizer, but he wasn't a very good, he didn't like to use his army, so to say. And uh, Lincoln is oftentimes quoted as saying that, well, if he won't use the army, I'd like to borrow it from him sometime. What were the general's battle plans for Antietam? McClellan actually got a hold of Robert E. Lee's orders. He's, Robert E. Lee's army was split apart. And a two men from, a, I believe it was an Indiana regiment or an Illinois regiment, found Lee's lost orders wrapped around some cigars in the field. And it basically explained where his army was. So McClellan knew what Lee was going to do. Unfortunately, McClellan, like I had said earlier, wasn't a very good battlefield general, so to say, because he was very slow. He always overestimated the enemy's force. And even though he knew that if he could quickly strike Lee, he'd be able to defeat them, defeat Lee, before the rest of Lee's army got here. Unfortunately, um, that wasn't able to happen. So Lee basically was fighting a defensive campaign trying to keep his army together until it could all come to one place and then they could move south because he knew that McClellan had his orders. Um, Lee also wanted to capture the arsenal at Harper's Ferry. And he sent Stonewall Jackson's men to go do that. And they actually captured it. They forced the surrender of 12,000 Union troops. Um, McClellan basically sent his army in piecemeal at the battle starting at the north side, and then it shifted to the center, and then it shifted south. What was the impact on the civilians as the battle progressed? Well, the town of Sharpsburg was very small, very tight-knit community. We got about 100,000 troops, 100,000 plus troops, invading their homes and fighting a battle that lasted roughly about 24 hours from beginning stages to the end, and left close to 30,000 casualties. So you could, the impact was huge. I mean, people had to run for their lives. Um, families that did get caught and the uh, couldn't get out of town before the battle erupted basically hid in their basements and waited it out. I mean, crops were destroyed. I mean, it's harvest time. Um, you know, there was a battle that took place in a cornfield, and they said that the corn was cut like somebody had just taken a sigh and just went through everything. Wow. So whole crops were destroyed and the town was devastated after the battle. Wow. What were some of the most pop more popular weapons used during combat? Actually, I can demonstrate them here for you. Since they're right here. This is the U.S. model 1861 Springfield. It's a 58 caliber rifle. It fires what's called the mini ball. Um, its accuracy is about six to eight hundred yards. And it's a nine step process to load this. It was actually used by both sides. The other one, this other rifle we have right here, this is the 1853 Enfield. It's British made. It was actually used by both sides during the war. About 900,000 of these came over. By 1862, almost every regiment in the Confederate Army had rifles. However, in the Union Army, 
some regiments were using what are called smooth bores. <coughs> Excuse me. And a smooth bore shoots with this is a, called a round ball. The difference between a smooth bore and a rifle is a rifle has grooves, kind of like a barbershop pole going down, so it puts a spin on the bullet. A smooth bore is basically just a tube. This ball, or yeah, this type of ammunition is accurate up to about 100 yards. Outside of 100 yards, they couldn't hit the broad side of a barn, so they have to get in real close in order for their fire to be effective. One of the reasons why you had Bloody Lane, because the Union's Irish Brigade were all armed with what's called buck and ball, which would be this round ball here with three smaller balls attached, so it's almost like a shotgun. Well, again, it's only accuracy is about 75 to 80 yards is its effective range, 100 yards max. So these men were charging these entrenched Confederates in the bloody lane, or the sunken road, armed with these Enfields, and they were just mowing them down. So even though both sides used these, the generals still couldn't grasp the tactics needed to, you know, fully utilize the capabilities of the mini ball. A lot of the generals went to West Point on both sides. And at West Point, they were still teaching tactics with the round ball. One of the reasons why he had such high casualties in the Civil War wasn't until 1863 that the generals started saying, oh, hey, our tactics are out of date, we need to update them. And then you start seeing trench warfare digging in and kind of segues its way into World War One. Uh, did any war tactics change or advance due to the battle? Yes. Uh, like I had said in the previous question, the tactics were outdated for the weaponry that was being used. Um, a lot of generals the old Napoleonic style of marching your men shoulder to shoulder in huge formations and long lines doesn't really work with the new weaponry that you're going to be seeing in the Civil War. <laughs> Excuse me. And as the war drove on, more and more soldiers would be issued these rifled, uh, these rifles. So a lot of the tactics would be to entrench, dig in, fight smaller battles with less men for smaller strategic goals instead of just trying to overwhelm your enemy. What happened to the soldiers that were wounded during the battle? Um, well, it all depended on the type of ammunition that you were wounded with. Um, say you were wounded with the uh, round ball. Um, it's slow moving, so when it hits anything, it's going to keep its shape. So if you're wounded in the arm, chances are they're just going to extract the bullet, try and take any clothing that might be in the wound, Set the bone, much like you do with a broken bone. So, yep, band you up, out the door you go. If you're wounded with the mini ball, however, the wound is going to be a lot more traumatic because it's made of soft lead that whenever it hits anything, it expands, kind of mushrooms. So it doesn't break bones, it shatters them. One of the reasons why you had such large amount of amputations during the war, and when you have an amputation, this is the instrument you're going to use. It's called a bone saw. So if the surgeon is who you're going to go see at the field hospital. He's going to do what's called triage, which is quickly identifying the level of wound you have. So if you're wounded in the head or the abdomen, chances are you're not long for this world. You're mortally wounded. Now he might give you some something to help numb the pain, but he's not going to do any operation on you because he really doesn't have the time. Um, a one surgeon might have to see three, four hundred people. So if you're wounded in the extremities, you know the arms or the legs, he's going to treat you first because he you can he can save you. So he's going to again look at your wound. If it's traumatic, like you're hit with that mini ball, he's not there to save your limb. He's there to save your life. He's there to save as many lives as he can. So he's going to perform an amputation. He might give you a local anesthesia to help numb the area or numb your senses but you are going to be conscious for this so you're going to see what's going to happen he's going to cut the skin away he's going to take out his bone saw and he's going to literally saw your arm or leg off were there any medal of honor or purple heart recipients for the battle of antietam well the purple heart really hadn't been created yet for the civil war however the medal of honor was created in the civil war and there were exactly 20 recipients of the Medal of Honor at the Battle of uh, Antietam. Now, it was originally created for enlisted men to receive the Medal of Honor 
Um, it wasn't until late 1862 that they included officers. And um, there was over a thousand recipients in the Civil War, the Medal of Honor, the largest war to receive the most Medals of Honor. Um, quite a few in the Civil War actually received medals, two Medals of Honor. Um, but at Antietam, like I said, there were 20. Uh, most of them were from Pennsylvania and New York, a couple from Ohio, uh, Delaware, and Massachusetts. What are some of the famous landmarks of Antietam? Uh, there's actually quite a few. You have the, uh, the cornfield, which I had mentioned earlier. You have the Dunker Church. Um, you have the North Woods, or no, the West Woods, I'm sorry, the West Woods. You have Bloody Lane, which is probably the most, one of the most famous next to Burnside's Bridge. And those are pretty much the, the big hot spots at uh, Antietam that are world famous. What was the outcome of Antietam? Uh, it was tactically a draw. Um, neither side really claimed, neither side really won a decisive victory. Uh, the North claimed victory because the South, Robert E. Lee, uh, took his battered army, which barely survived, um, and headed back across the Potomac, and thus ending his 1862 invasion of the North. And it probably sealed the victory, ultimate victory for the North. Because um, with that, Abraham Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation. So now that they could tap um, African Americans as soldiers, um, it also changed the focus of the war from preserving the Union to ending slavery. So then that left uh, Europe pretty much out in the cold because now they wouldn't go and join sides with an institution that was for slavery especially England and France, who outlawed slavery um, quite a few years before the Civil War began. Um, so uh, for the Confederacy, you know, it kind of put the writing on the wall, essentially that, you know, it was going to take almost a miracle for them to win the war.